gave him moment of silence as a believer priest for the etiquette of Bible study. You can't study it in carnality. Identity of carnality would be personal sin. It could be mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. And the issue is to confess that through 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us, which restores us back to the fellowship with God under the principle of sanctification or ministry of the Holy Spirit who is able to teach you the truth of the word of God, which is able to set you free from the cosmic system that the devil runs in opposition to God. So I give you a moment to do that through your priesthood of 1 Peter 2, and then we'll get into our study. What I say to my people here uh, in the assembly hour of teaching, I say to those who are visiting with us on the Internet, The same etiquette is required of you. And so our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight. We pray that the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to our souls. Even though this is a tribulation for another day, we too go through tribulation, not to this extreme. But we do go through tribulation, and God is the protector. We are sealed. And, and we are, we are sealed, Paul says in Ephesians 4.30, unto the day of redemption. And I'm thankful for that. And uh, who signed off on that for me was God himself. And so I have the protective word of God over my life. I pray, Father, as we study this, that you would show us what, will be in the future historically. That's a pretty amazing idea. I mean, who could ever plot this out that far in advance? The one who plotted it out with Daniel. That's who. You're a great, sovereign, mighty God that has a loving care about each of us in Christ, and we're thankful for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I talked to John Dyer today, and he said this is our 11th lesson in this series entitled Daniel's 70 Weeks. I forget how many. I know I've, it's been many, but I hadn't kept up. But John says we're, this is our 11th. We, and we'll still have a few, a few more just to wrap this eschatology up. Two, two very important dictators of influence over the world. That's a pretty amazing thing over the world. Two important dictators that are involved in what we call eschatology or the study of the last days, especially of the tribulation, that are listed in, both of them are listed and given information about in Revelation 13. Well, you shouldn't be surprised about this because, listen, Daniel, and we studied this when we were in the sta Daniel talking about eschatology out of his book, he talked about the four different kingdoms that would rule over Israel uh, from the time of Daniel all, all the way to the crucifixion of Christ. I mean, he laid out, he laid out exactly the nations who were going to do that. Um, so it shouldn't surprise us that John, this would come back to us uh, rather than uh, Daniel but John would pick that up and carry that extended out beyond the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ into the future history that looks at the second coming of Christ. I mean, the first, Daniel took us to the first coming of Christ. John took us to the second. That's pretty amazing. And Daniel referenced to it, but he did it in kind of a code way called the Ancient of the Days. You remember that? The Ancient of the Days. But <clears throat> where he used that in reference. These two dictators that we're going to learn about in, in Revelation 13 will form an alliance with the devil uh, to fight against the plan of God, Jesus Christ, and the saints of God in what's called the, end, the last days of the angelic conflict. In our last, oh, by the way, I it was brought to my attention that um, our, our files should be Tuesday and not Sunday at the top of your paper. Okay? So what happens is you work on too many sermons. Uh, now, let me show you seven titles 
that are ascribed to the dictator of the revived Roman Empire. We studied in Daniel, the seventh chapter, verses seven through nine. One of the titles given to him was called the little horn. And you remember that? Um, a second title that's given to him out of Daniel 7 in that same passage, 7 through 9 and verse 23, is the fourth beast. That's really important. And the, the four beasts were the four different kingdoms that would rule over Israel to the coming of Christ. He's called the fourth beast, which would be the fourth kingdom. Um, in Revelation, as well as Daniel, Daniel 7 hint that um, there would be a beast from the sea and John carries that idea out into pretty good detail in Revelation uh, 13, 1 through 10, and mentions it again in the 17th chapter, verse 5. These are all references for you to study on your own, okay? Some of this stuff we've already talked. We have talked about, he's called the enemy on the white horse. Remember, <coughs> Jesus comes on a white horse. Of course, he's going to mimic that. And so we learned about the enemy on the white horse, which was part of the first seal. If you remember when we studied seals in um, Revelation, the sixth chapter, verses one to two. So he was the enemy riding a white horse. Uh, and then it, Paul talks about him in uh, different terms. Um, he's the man of lawlessness in Second, Tim, uh, Second Thessalonians 2, three through eight. There's a pretty good lengthy discussion on him being the man of lawlessness. And uh, Paul talks about the mystery of lawlessness is already beginning in the church age because they're the last before the tribulation, right? So he says it's already at work. The spirit of the Antichrist is already at work in the church age, right? Because, why? Because, yeah, very evident. Uh, and the reason is because we're the last before, right? We're the last hookup before the tribulation. Uh, he's called the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. And then the Antichrist, he, there's a reference to him uh, that way in 2, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 and 8. And of course, John. Now, did I put down John? Do you have John there, John? Like 1 John 2, yeah, okay. Uh, 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 in 1 John 2, 18, John says the Antichrist is coming. In 18, verse 22, he tells you that his great platform will deny that Jesus is the Christ. He was never the Christ. He, he was a phony baloney. He was a false Christ. Okay? That, that, that's how, how the Antichrist... And then uh, the fourth chapter, verse 3, John says that he will deny that Jesus is from God. And, uh, and he'll prove that he is. And the false prophet will help him as he performs miracles. He, he'll cause his, his, he will cause his statue to speak. John Dyer and I, we had an idea of making a robot, robot that would interact with customers and we wanted to see if we could develop this robot that could actually go to malls and interact with people and get them to change where they were going to go to another store to buy something on a discount. So we made this little robot. We dressed it up into a, a, a person. And we had to go out and set up the whole we, we did this at the Galleria. Those people gave us permission to do this. And we had to go out and we had to set up a perimeter so that we could control that robot, you know, the, the power system, so that we could control, control him and get, keep control of him. But not, we, <laughs> we didn't want lawsuits. Well, then we set up, they gave us a room upstairs then we realized as we began to play with this thing that we needed to have, we, we wanted to encounter, we need to have eyes somewhere because the thing went through the whole mall. And we were in one little location. We could see a pretty good stripe, but we couldn't get it all the way. So we had to put spotters up there with mics that could tell us what was going on, describe people. The most amazing thing in the whole wide world. You, you have no idea 
how powerful. And we, if we would, there are regulars, unbeknown to me, that go to the malls on a regular basis. They go every day. Some go to walk and some go, I don't know what they, the steal or I don't know what they go there for. <laughs> the name the spotter would go down get the name just casually get the name we would log it so the next time they came in we could talk to them well hey Susie how you doing and we had this we had this robot and they would stop and engage with this robot it was the darndest thing you ever saw and they they thought for sure there was a little person in there and uh, but anyhow at Fran we ha and we took people out of the, our church Fran and a whole bunch of people uh, worked that for us we put spotters up there. It was a darn thing. And listen, we could get people could be one, um, one, headed, where, where are you going? They could be going to Sears on one end of the, we could stop them dead in their tracks, turn them around and go to the other place to get a free umbrella. Go, make them walk to the other end of the mall for a free umbrella. I mean, we, we, were, we had eyes on everything moving in there. And... Um, then we were able to pitch the people on fire and security and all that kind of stuff. I mean, we, we, but like, like all good things, we, we turned that <laughs> loose. We should have stayed with that. We really close. Uh, uh, that was talking. And if people paid attention, we never had to voice the same voice. We tried to keep women voices. But they never, they never were the same, right? I mean, hi, Carol, how you doing? I, well, I'm doing fine. And they got where they're just like friends. Well, come on, I'll walk with you while you go. To, listen, there's the free, listen, there's something free down the street down here. Come on, I'll walk with you. It was the darndest thing. So when, when we have a statue speaking, uh, and I said, well, hi, Carol, how you doing? You got a prayer request for me today. Uh, that's, that, we did that stuff. <laughs> so I understand people. I understand people. I was amazed. I'm a, oof. I was really amazed. Um, so here's point number two. So there are seven names on this thing. This the second thing is that the beast from the sea, we call we call <laughs> we refer to him as the revi the dictator of the Roman Empire. The beast from the sea will be a Gentile ruler with a worldwide influence. We learn this out of Revelation as well as Daniel. Uh, Daniel tells us that the key for us is that this, this beast from the sea, this beast from the sea uh, in Daniel is, is called the fourth beast or the fourth kingdom, and we know that's Rome. <laughs> we know who these four kingdoms are because we've lived the history of them. So there, there's no doubt about that. That's how we know it's a Gentile. Uh, Revelation, the thirteenth chapter, we have Satan on the, the sea, and he coming up out of the sea, and he, and then he identifies him in a way that Daniel has identified him. His empire is described by Daniel in this way. In the second chapter of Daniel, Daniel describes this his empire as the feet of the image of the statue. Now you got to go back and you have to study that. But there's a statue, and all the kingdoms, the four kingdoms are identified in that statue. The fourth kingdom is the feet, you know, the feet of uh, clay and clay. iron or something. Uh, his empire is the feet, feet of the statue. He will be the dictator of the revived Roman Empire, the fourth kingdom, um, of uh, Daniel 2, 40 through 45. So Daniel, the second chapter, is well worth look, your look. Uh, he is also the little horn from the fourth beast of Daniel 7, 7 through 9. Now, we've looked at this. Now, it's, now maybe some of this is starting, you're starting to be able to put some of this a little bit together. Uh, Revelation 13, 1 describes this dictator of the revived Roman Empire as part of the ten horns, that is the Roman Empire, with the seven heads, that's the nations, at administering cycles of discipline to Israel over that period, Ten crowns are the nations started independently, but all fell to Rome. And the blasphemous names are the titles of the deification of the hero worships, the, the emperor worships, for example. And I put one down there that has been famously ascribed uh, uh, to Medica, but I'm, you know, it's historians say that. I can't get, they got no biblical reference to it, 
but we know that was a guy who was reigned during John's time. And we know that was, but anyhow, uh, uh, it is, uh, historians say that the title he chose for himself was our Lord our, and our God. That he, he chose that for himself. And why did he do it? Well, listen, here's why he did it. This is at least John's idea. Our Lord and our God was a title given to Jesus by the church. Worthy art thou, our Lord and our God, to receive glory, honor, and power, for thou didst create all things, and because of thee, because of thy will, they existed and were created. It is believed because of that prominent teaching in the same time of Dominic that they, he chose that title for that reason. And the Antichrist, it would sure be his. There is no doubt about that. That's his, that's his whole premise. Okay? Now, it's also interesting to me that this was pretty popular. I don't know that it's that popular today other than hymns or songs and that. But I, wa I want to show you this, this idea uh, of how prevalent this idea was in the first century in the church. I want you to look at, uh, I put this down here. This is Doubting Thomas. You're familiar with this. But I want to bring it into a context, maybe a little different than we might normally think about it. In the John 20, looking at verses 24 uh, through 29, just to look at it a little different. Well, I lost my place. Uh, 20, 24. You remember, this is where uh, the disciples have dis uh have witnessed the resurrection of Christ, have met with him, but Thomas wasn't with him. They came back and told Thomas Christ did that. He went, I don't believe it. And then, you know, he goes through this, and that's where he gets the name, Doubting Thomas. Boy, talk about nicknames that stick. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Thomas, one of the 12 didymus, was not with him when Jesus came. Other disciples, therefore, were saying to him, we have seen the, seen the Lord. He said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my, you know, this is one of the things, you know, a lot of historians would, uh, were, and I don't know why they would even go there, but they would say his hands were never nailed. Uh, they were tied and all this kind of business because that's the way they did it and that. But Thomas was there. I mean, Thomas knew his, his uh, wasn't there, but he understood that he was nailed to the cross. Well, anyhow, it, I just threw that out there. It didn't cost you any extra. Unless I shall see in his hands the imprints of the nails and put my fingers into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were inside and Thomas with them and Jesus came. The doors having been shut stood in their midst. And he said, peace be with you. I thought that was interesting because normally he says, do, he usually when he shows up like that, he scares them half to death, right? He says, stop being afraid. But I guess they're used to this kind of appearance now, right? It has been eight days and he's been all over the place. Um, then he said to Thomas, reach here your finger and see my hands. Uh, reach here your hands and put in my side and be not unbelieving, but believing. And listen to what Thomas said. This is a really big deal now. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. See, that's his phrase. That's his phrase. And, it, and I'm just trying to show you, it was a very prominent phrase uh, attached to Jesus Christ after his resurrection. <coughs> this is going to be prominent because this is what the dictator of the right Roman Empire is going to claim for himself with that statue after he has his mortal wound and the false prophet sells the idea that he's been raised from the dead, that he is the true Christ and deserves to be worshipped. He is the true Messiah. This other one was a phony baloney. just irritates me to even think about it. Point number three. But you know, listen to me. I got to thinking about this. Now it irritated Stu out of me. And so I got to thinking about this for a moment. You know why this would be an easy sell? Because there's no church. And what's going to fill that void? You know, we have no idea what a powerful a powerful force we are in the world for God today. I mean, even on our west, even on our worst day, we're still pretty powerful. You understand? In the kingdom's work, 
But when you remove the church of Jesus Christ in a twinkling of an eye, now think about this, not a long drawn out process like moving people from uh, one island to another by a boat, you know, a rowboat. <laughs> I mean, this is in a twinkling of an eye. Think of the void, the, the spiritual void that's going to be as the, as the tribulation opens up. I mean, that helped me when I stopped and went like, oh, Father, all that. And he went, mm, there's, a, there's going to be an enormous spiritual void in the world that makes this easy. Do what? Yeah. There, there, there you go. Point number three, Satan, he's known as the great red dragon. I wonder where we get that idea with horns and all that. With hot sauce. With hot sauce. Yeah. Oh, they have red dragon. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. What do I know? Uh, the, the Satan, uh, the dragon, it plays an enormous role, of course. Uh, in Revelation, the 12th chapter, verses 3 through 12, the 13th chapter, 1 through 4, we see him. Uh, verse 11, the 16th chapter of Revelation, 13 through 14, 20th chapter, verse 2. Uh, in chapter 13, remember, he is the dragon that's standing on the sea looking for the, the beast to come. I mean, this is a great day for him when he's got this guy because he's, he's going to make him equal to Christ in his task. Um, he's going to be there when the, with the beast of the land. He's going to form alliance with these guys. In chapter 16, they're going to be the unholy alliance, the Trinity. Um, and he's identified in clear terms of the scriptures in Revelation 20, verse 2, which is well worth your time to read. Um, in John 12, 31, he's called the prince. Is that He's the whole archon. Uh, he is the ruler of the world or the prince of the world. In Revelation 12, 31, 14, 30, 16, 11. But he's always, he's always playing under a handicap because of the power of Christ in the church. He's always under, but when the church is gone, he's no longer under handicap. So uh, in 1 John 5, 19, he's called the evil one, the power of the evil one. The dictator of revived Roman Empire will accept Satan's crown of rulership, the whole argon, which Jesus rejected in Matthew 4, 9 through 10. Maybe he wants power, he wants authority, all those things, right? that Satan is able to give him authority, power, all those things, all those things that this is his driving life to have. During the tribulation, Satan, the dictator of the arrived Roman Empire, and the dictator of Palestine called the false prophet or the beast from the land uh, will form a holy trinity alliance. And boy, will they, will they really shake it up. Point number four, this is an interesting part of the tribulation that people really don't pay attention to. There, Apollon, we, we learn about Apollon in uh, Revelation, uh, the, um, I think it's um, the ninth chapter and then the 13th. But Apollon is the king of the fallen angels of the abyss. The abyss is Tartarus. I want, you to, I want to show you this to you. I want you to open your Bibles with me. I want you to go to um, second. I don't know if this is on your paper. Is second Peter 2, 4 in your paper? Yeah. Oh, boy. I, I tell you, I spoil you people so bad. Thank you. I know. I know. I wasn't looking. F f just give me money. I wasn't looking for compliments. Um, no. Uh, uh, here we are. Look at look at second. Uh, I mean, second Peter two, four. If God did not spare the angels when they sinned and, and we're in Genesis chapter six through nine. If God did not spare angels when they sinned, uh, but cast them into hell, that's T-A-R-T-A-R-U-S, and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. And he's going to tell you more about it in verse 5. And did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness. Now, while we're in 2 Peter, let's drop back to 1 Peter. Because when Jesus died on the cross, 
His body went to the tomb. His soul went to Sheol. And his, father, and his spirit went to the Father into your hands. Remember, he said, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, in 1 Peter, the third chapter, I think I put this on your paper too, didn't, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Somewhere up there. Yeah, probably. Anyhow, 13. We're, let's see. We're where? We're, we're, um, what verses am I looking for? Eight, 18? Eight, 18. I'm in uh, 1 Peter, third chapter, verse 18. Uh, for Christ also died for his sins once, for, uh, of the just for the unjust, in order to bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. In which, made alive in the spirit, we know in Romans 8, listen, we know in Romans 8, 11, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. In which, also he went and made proclamation to the spirits, that's the, that, that's, that's what he's talking about, the second Peter, the spirits. That, that's the demonic angelic forces of Noah's day. To the spirits now in prison that in the, and who, uh, who once were disobedient when the, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which there was few, eight persons uh, brought safely through. Okay? So, when, he, when Christ dies, his soul goes to Sheol. He says to the thief, I'll see you there, right? I'll see you there. Uh, so, we know he makes a stop there. There's a gulf. As far as we know, he, he doesn't go to the place called torment where the unbeliever is, but he does visit this place, right? He does visit him. And he gives some type of proclamation. Um, in, like in Acts, the eighth chapter, every time uh, he confronted the demon, the demon was fearful that he would be sent to this place. He did not want to be sent to this place because this was the holding ground. <laughs> when you left there, the next stop, as far as you're concerned, was going to be a lake of fire. Um, so this is, it's just all kind of interesting how this all fits together. Apollon, but in Revelation, uh, in the ninth chapter, look down on your paper. I'm at point number four on your paper. I'm back on your paper now. Uh, in Revelation 9, 11, and 12, it says, we have a king over them. They have a king over them, the angel of the abyss. And, and, he, and we know his name, his, his name in Hebrew right? Abaddon. And in the Greek, his name is Apollon. And, and listen, Revelation says, this is important. And we talked about this when we, got, when we went through the, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. The first bowl was passed. Remember, that was during the trumpets. If you go back and look at Revelation 8, that the, the first bowl was passed. You were at the trumpets. And uh, the first bowl was passed. Two, two woes, and so what we have with the three woes was the fifth trumpet, the sixth trumpet, the seventh trumpet, and if you recall, the seventh trumpet was the seven bowls. Right? You remember that? I hope so. But anyhow, um, see, when you understand the background to some of this stuff, it helps you. Um, and you know what the seven bowls are called? Listen, boy, you think the seals was bad, and they were. You think the trumpets were bad, and they were. You know what the seven bowls are called? They're called the raft of God. The seven of them are called the raft of God. <clears throat> I guess that'd probably be worse than my mama's. A little bit. I ain't going to be there called the raft of God, people. I think out there, like in, see, he tells us the first woe is past and you got two more to go, and we, you don't even get to that. See, like in the eighth chapter, you don't even wind up with the discussion of that until you get to chapter 16. If you remember, remember we called them interludes? And then when you get to them, they're called the seven bowls of the raft of God. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, he did more than you'll ever imagine when he died on that cross for you and me. We just think, we, we, look, we, we anticipate and look forward to the coming of Christ. We're the only people on earth that do that. Just think what it's going to be like if you... What are people that not look for? Well, if you've ever known anybody that died that didn't know Christ, and you ever, if you was with them and you saw the agony of their, of their leaving, well, the second, so in, in Revelation 11 chapter, in Revelation 11 chapter, verse 7 on your paper, he will begin, uh, uh, he will begin by attacking and killing the two witnesses of the tribulation. In Revelation, the 11 chapters where, you, where he, he died. listen, he, he's going to make, he's, he's going to make a deal out of them. I mean, he's going to, what he's going to do to these two witnesses is, um, like many, Rome, many of the Roman emperors did if you crossed them. They made an example of you to everybody else who would even think of doing this. Here's what it says. And when they had finished their testimony, the beast that had come up out of the abyss. Remember this now. This is not the dictator of the revival. This is not him. And it's not the palace. It's not the false prophet, right? This is the guy that's king over all the fallen angels in the abyss. Did you get that? Don't miss this. And when they had finished, so that's a nice chapter. <coughs> right? We know who he is. So when he had finished testimony, the beast that came up from the abyss, the pollen, will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And uh, this, holy, this holy trinity alliance uh, We'll make a big deal to the rest of the people about it. And the scripture says in the 11th chapter, verse 14, now listen, when they kill these two, listen, and remember who kills them. Who, who killed the two witnesses? That could be a gate question. No, it won't be ours, but. Uh, just remember who this is, right? It's Apollon, isn't he? It's the king of the fallen angels of the abyss, Right? I say right. I'm not looking for an answer. I'm just trying to say, you know, pay attention. Now, when this occurs, watch 1114, the second, listen, when this occurs to these two witnesses, right? You know, the two, 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 two witnesses, the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming. So we know actually when this is going to transpire, don't we? Right? Right? Because we, we, we have paid up with it. We've paid attention to the woes. There are three woes. We've paid attention to that. Uh, the sixth bowl in Revelation 16, 13 is this unholy trinity. And you know what they're preparing themselves for? Listen, they are, you know what they're, they kill these two witnesses. And from the 11th chapter, they're now preparing to take on the war of wars. You talking about the third world war? Listen, this third world war isn't, isn't about humans. It's about the third world war is about God versus Satan. It's, it's not, oh, it's going to be, it's going to be terrible on earth. Listen, it's going to be terrible. This war is not about man and man. This is not about this king fighting this king. This is about God fighting Satan. This is for the whole shooting match. You understand? He's so, he's so stupid. But what makes him think he can fight God and win? <laughs> so stupid. You don't mind me calling the devil stupid, do you? Okay. Now, you can read about this. Say, I'm in chapter 16, right? See? And we're talking about the bowls. You say, when you, when you talk about the seven bowls, you're in chapter 16 of Revelation. When you get to the sixth bowl, they're in preparation for Armageddon, what we call Armageddon. The reason that's the war of wars is because, listen, 
It is the forces, the forces of God of heaven fighting the forces of earth, which is not man, it's demonic. This is going to be a war of wars. It don't matter how many times God whips this group of people, they still are just as dumb as bricks. <laughs> Man, I got out of the pit already having been thrown there one time. What are you fighting for, son? I don't know. Hoping I won't have to go to the lake of fire. That's my next trip. How, how do you think that's going to work out? Well, we're going to lose, but I still got to fight because my commander says so. But my point is, they're now in preparation for Armageddon. When they kill these two witnesses of God, these two witnesses sent from God, and they, and if you read about it, they do it. I mean, sometimes when you read about the Roman empires and how they treated Christians, look, Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, places like that. I mean, what they do to these two guys is, it's terrible. I mean, when we see what the evil in man can do to forge people, one another is enough, but this is beyond. This is, you talk about satanic, this is demonic killing, right? I just, the fifth point. The dictator of the revived Roman Empire will become an ecumenical leader of the World Federation of Religions because there's this great void, right? Church is gone. The, did you ever stop to think about this? The great divine agency as a custodian, the word of God and all that, this is where that void is. It's an enormous void. There's never been a void like this. Since, Gen since Genesis, after the flood, there's never been a void like this is going to be ever in the world. There's never been this religious vacuum. There's never been this vacuum of God. I mean, it's Revelation 13, uh, 7 through 10. This is, the, this is where this false prophet from Israel will be a big deal. This guy will play an enormous role in this because filling that void uh, out of that group. The false prophet of Palestine called the beast of the land in Revelation 13 will help enforce the worship of the dictated revived Roman Empire. You know, this, this goes back, show you the angelic conflict, how far this is ingrained in man. This goes all the way back to Genesis 3, 5. You know what the, de you know what the devil told the first two couple? And this will be at the end. The last of the human race will hear the same kind of thing. But you know what he told them? Listen to me, you will be like God. Genesis 3, 5, you will be like God. They went, well, I'm all for that. And they forgot the, what that would cost. But this is what the end is going to be about. As far as a a point of reference is called the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24, 15 through 28. The abomination of desolation when he sets up that statue, right, in the temple and demands worship. And then the false prophet is able to make that, that statue preach and do all kinds of stuff. Oh, the, uh, this is, you're going to read about this next week in Revelation 13, 11 through 18. The worship of the dictator revived Roman Empire is actually the worship of Satan. Actually, the worship of Satan. In Revelation 13, 12, he exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it worship the first beast. This is the dictator of Palestine. And to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. Now, my closing remark. The dictator revived Roman Empire will be miraculously healed from the fatal wound. The false prophet, as we see next week, 
will help sell it to the public as a resurrection from the dead and a reason for him to be worshipped. Revelation 13, 3, and then 12 through 15. He's going to be called a master deceiver. This guy's going to be empowered by, by Satan to do all these things, and it's just going to be a mess. In Revelation 13, 14, we will learn, he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast that's the dictator of the Roman Empire, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast, watch this now, who had the wound of the sword and had come back to life. See that? I mean, uh, the wound of the sword would be an assassination attempt. It's what most people think. Here's another thing that I found important because I like... I like languages uh, other than English, apparently. I like them all but that. The Greek word for slain in Revelation 13, 3. Let's go over there and take a look at that just for a moment. 13, 3. This is talking about this. 13, 3. Uh, where he talks about, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and the and his fatal wound was healed. See the word slain? Now, I'll tell you what's interesting about that word. I wrote it on your paper. It's S-P-H-A-Z-O. Wounded, wounded to death, yeah, same thing. Fatal wound. Fatal wound. It appeared to be that way. It is the, listen, th this is a unique word. And I'm going to, and I'm going to show you why. It is the same word used with Jesus' death in Revelation 5, 6, 9, and 12. The same word. There's no coincidence John's doing this. 5, 6, 9, and something. Um, okay, 5. One of the elders said, stop weeping. Behold, the lion. Um, no, that's not. Let's say 6. It was 5. What did I say? 5, 6? 6. I need to look down here. Five, six, five, six. And I saw between the throne with the four creatures and the elder of the lamb standing as, as if slain with the seven horns, seven eyes, and seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now look at verse down nine. This, this, this is a big one right here. Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals. For thou was slain and did purchase for God with thy blood from every tribe, tongue, people, nations. Okay? The word is slain. Now, I'm going to tell you what, why this is. L listen to me now. Listen close. This word is used for s sacrificial slain. Do you understand that? Because it's connected with his blood. Right? This is not just a normal death. I'm talking about Jesus now. That, he sa that was a sacrificial death. Right? The lamb, sacrificial death. This slain here is the idea. This word in the Greek is the idea. Now, I can show you it clear as a bell. One more time. Let's go to 1 John 3, 12, and I'll show it to you, and you'll know the story, and the story will tell you how this, was, how this is. Um, 1 John, I'm back in the Revelation. 1 John 3, 12. Now, you'll know this when you see it. You'll be familiar with this. Um, <coughs> But I wanted you to put your eyes on it. I could have told you, and you had said, oh, yeah, I remember. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one, that is the, that's Satan. That's the same one that's operating in Revelation, the dragon, the evil one, and slew his brother. The same word. He slew his brother. You know what it was? Listen to me. He went out there in the field, right? You know the story. And what he did is he took the sacrificial knife that Abel used to, to do the lamb, to cut the lamb's throat, to shed the blood, which was representative of Christ on the cross. Agreed? He took that, that and that, that's how that's identified. He took that sacrificial knife. That's what's described here. Right? That sacrificial knife. 
that's the idea behind this word. This is the idea. A sacrificial death is behind this word. I just wanted you to see that. I think it's important. The Greek word for slain is the same word used that way, and it's a sacrificial death. It was the sacrificial knife that got, and you can see the motive. I mean, how bad was that? That motive behind killing his own brother took the sacrificial knife and cut his throat in the field and uh, let him bleed to death. And how does, listen, how does the man get that depraved? You know how bad? The devil. It's satanic. Now, the most of us have good sense. We know that even when you see it, if you're not a believer, you go like, that is, that's too far out there. It usually is, isn't it? My final point is that the, the dictator of the arrived Roman Empire, called by most people the Antichrist, and the dictator of Palestine, normally called by the false prophet, will be thrown, now watch this, will be thrown into the lake of fire with the victory of the Armageddon of the second coming of Christ. Now listen, when we get through with this, we're going to go to the great white throne judgment before the great white throne judgment comes onto the scene, which is Revelation 20. We're, we're 19 now with Armageddon. When, when the victory of Armageddon is there, they, they, these two dictators are taken and thrown into the lake of fire. And Satan, listen to me now, and Satan is put into, the, into Tartarus for a thousand years. And when he's taken out of there, he's going to be thrown in. These two guys are not going before their great white throne judgment. Think about that for a moment. Any more than Satan. This unholy trinity alliance was really a big deal. Think about that. Well, I'm, well, anyhow, I left scripture for you to read on the bottom of your page. Scripture like Revelation 19, 17 through 21, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, 8, Daniel 7, 22 through 28. It's on your paper for those who are visiting us by internet. You know, when you go to our website, you can pick up a copy of, the, of this as well as listen to the teaching of it. Uh, I highly recommend, under at least my teaching, that you pick up the voice as well as the paper because I'm going to tell the paper is just an outline stuff. I'm going to tell you a, hot, a whole lot more as a rule. Uh, I use that as a sheet to just allow my people to concentrate, not have to write all the time. Um, but I don't, I don't put everything down on that piece of paper. So if you think that piece of paper is going to carry you, you need them both. You need the paper as a copy to follow along and just to add notes to it as you go. Um, but if you're interested in, in Bible study, you need to, if you're in a 40-mile radius, I, can, I tell you, you ought to come and sit with us in class. Not sit someplace else. You ought to come to class. But I, Because I believe in Hebrews 10.25, I believe you shouldn't forsake the assembly of yourself together if you have the opportunity. I know there are a lot of people who don't have it. I've got a wife myself that's home. I mean, there's no way we can get her out and do things like we used to be able to do. But uh, it's not volitional, people. It's not volitional. Well, let's, let's close this session with a word of prayer, and then we'll do our Bible study as we, I mean, our prayer session as we normally do. Father, we're so thankful for the attendance and for the attention. Just, just have a great group of people that come and visit, and those who live within a, uh, you know, a driving distance. For us, that's 40 miles. Our people come 40, at least 40 miles to Bible study. Uh, we're thankful for that because of the church. The church is the name of the game. It's, it's local. It's community. It's national. It's geographical. It's the dynamics of the born-again people together, exercising gifts and ministry, outreaches, we're so thankful for that. 
I encourage those that are in our periphery to come visit us on Tuesday and Wednesday, even if they go to other churches that aren't, that don't have studies on those nights, we encourage them, just come and be part of our fellowship. We'd like to meet them and be a part of their lives as well. Saddle up next to them in their ministries. And those, Father, that are in foreign shores, we're thankful to have you out there and that you're interested in study with us. We will try to arm you as best we can off our website, doctrinalstudies.com. You can download anything we have on there. The only thing we ask you is never sell it. Don't sell it. Give it. Give it like salvation, for by grace we're saved through faith and not of ourselves as a gift of God. We give it to you that way. Our people try to bear all the costs to bring it to you under grace so that you can absorb it and give it out on grace basis. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.